Wonderful to see so many of you here. A great occasion to be here with John on the holy rug. So um, I think we're going to start by reading a bit, reading a little bit, and giving some context for the work, and then um, back and forth, some questions. So. Do you want to start reading, or do you? Um, do you want to go back and forth a little, or do you want to all read a chunk? And Let's go back and forth. Um, I, if someone had told me uh, 30 years ago when I was in high school that I would be sharing a stage with Ann Waldman, who taught my high school teacher at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at the Naropa Institute, I think my head would have exploded. Um, so if I burst into flame in the middle of this, don't, don't worry, that's just a natural reaction to being four feet from Ann Waldman's energy field. He's dating me, but I'll, um, I'll just evanesce into the negative ions of the Rocky Mountains, which is what I love about being here. Do you feel them? Yes, they're very healthy for you. And better poetry, better meditation. Um, I'm going to read from, I think, a couple of different things. This, this book is the new book, Trickster Feminism, and I'll be uh, in conversation about that book a little later this afternoon, but maybe I'll do a little touch of that. And the books prior to that have been, um, again, these long poem length, poem, book length poems. So they're uh, meant to be read as one text, you know, sort of, I, I, don't, I don't call them epics quite, but they're long poems. And this last book was a challenge because I had to come up with separate poems. I wasn't even sure I could write a short poem. So that's, there, there's a little bit of um, uh, challenge for, for that, uh, you know, when you come to pull things together. I really enjoy that long uh, montage effect where you can move things around and actually play with layers, this kind of syncretic way that you can build within the montage structure. But from um, Gossamurmur, Gossamurmur, in fact, is a, a sort of romp. It's an allegory about the preservation of poetry's archive and the, um, the um, I guess you'd call her the heroine of the story, has to travel through all sorts of obstacles and come up with a plan of how to save poetry's archives it's from these threatening, the deciders who determine and want to, you know, the fate of everyone and want to murder poetry. So it's a really a tall order. And so there are lines from poems that are trying to be saved from other people. There's um, encounters all over the world traveling through different, different time zones. It uh, sort of resolves in the tundra. Not the best place to build an archive. It's not really the best, uh, you know, climate control and all that. Um, but there's a doppelganger, this, this heroine, Anne, is a, also a doppelganger, Anne, and she's um, having to come up and face these you know, difficult uh, deciders who want to create a replica of hers for, for their own use. But I'll read, just read the archive litany, which is the, sort of in praise and ode to the idea of archive. How many people have their own archives? Wonderful. I mean, a library is a kind of archive, correspondence. If you're writers, you save your first drafts. Um, if you're an artist, you have you know, many, many things that go into making of the work. So I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with archive. I also think it's a way to let people of the future know that we weren't all just killing one another. We had you know, other projects, you know, very modest projects that you can keep in boxes. And, so, and I, you know, I joke about how it's going to be the slime molds of the future that will inherit the earth, and so we're going to have to learn how to translate into slime moldies. But this is still in, I guess, American English. Archive is shelter. Archive is the disembodied voice of a palpable consciousness. Archive is a jumbled dream. Archive needs poetry you must never forget. Is inscription, is inspiration. Archive tells many stories. I am Archon, and a mere inscripted postcard is archive. 
When we return to our speech and start our own country, take this as a directive. Memory of an animal is also yours. Archive all opposable thumbs we have record of and many wisdom identities. Archives murmur circulates around the room. Archive lets originals breathe. You can't tamper with archive. It's a strange cosmology. Archive is an antithesis to a war on memory and stealing a poet fire. Archive is the tender footprint. Archive will not tread on the footprints of the most vulnerable. Archive is a trust. Let archive record the names of those going out of this world. Tristan Albatross, all disappeared, all suicided. Archive listens into the margins. Archive is a privileged topology. Archive exists as a map of the future beyond the exigencies of electronic media, which has transformed the relative reality of homo sapiens sapiens. If you are good at this, please memorize. Are you good at this? Memorize archive. Archive could be safe from composite strife. Gain intellectual control of the collection. Consider tape life expectancy. Water pipes run through storage space. Materials are housed in a hundred year flood plan with environmental swings. No climate control. Security, multiple keys to storage exists. The space is not secured. Walls that lead space at ceiling height can be easily breached. Digital collections on CDs which are at risk themselves due to disk failure and equipment obsolescence. Archive is housed by and reanimates sentient beings. Archive is nest, is housed, is reverie. Archive will hold you and the line comes, I swear it, from the breath. Archive is Obad, is Alba, is Tagalid, is seduction. Archive is dying, and archive is not dying. Who lives to push the buttons to install the implants of archive? A far agent, a forest, a mountain to climb, an orange sunset, a cloth for the body, strong ropes to circle and carry, dynamite with an app for, for Soil content, an app to read the constellations in the sky. Moon, a fingernail above you is a modest proposal, proposal and sometimes a wildebeest on the tundra remembers a former life. And an albatross crossed your shadow at sea one day. Tristan, whose name means sadness, quested the grail and drank a love potion. This is the sublimated test of future identity t t t t t t t t t t t t identity t t t t t t t t t t t t identity t t t t t t t t t t t t and that was written in boulder Thank you for that poem. Um, uh, my archive is my closet, which is, a, is an archive to my dishevelment. Um, but as a poet growing up, um, I, I think I, I, I have a lot to um, thank you for because I think you uh, have told us all to wake up um, over and over again in a billion beautiful ways. Um, and one of the things that you helped me realize is that what is missing from the world is, is an archive of violence. Um, my first book, uh, The Maps, was written in the wake of my mother's death, and it's a series of elegies, but one thing she gifted to me upon her departure was to look at the world through its absences, which, as a white man growing up in Sacramento, is not something that comes naturally to you, but through um, having the violence of someone's departure uh, happen to me, um, as it happens to all of us. Anyone here who is over a certain age has had it happen to you. Um, I suddenly looked at the world differently. Um, I, uh, the poem I'm going to read from is very brief, because um, I'd rather live in her archive than mine. Um, but uh, after that, I finished maps. I was worried that I could only write based on um, things happening to me that mattered. And I spend part of my year living uh, and teaching in Paris. I know it's terrible. You can all tie, cry tiny tears for me. Um, but I, I live on a, the Luxembourg Gardens, which uh, is a park built by uh, Mary de' Medici uh, out of her nostalgia for Florence. Um, she was married to the King of France, who was then murdered, um, and then she was, had to leave uh, France in a hurry because um, they, once they got her money, they were after her neck. 
so that park tumbled through the ages, and I realized in sitting in the park that all the things I was interested in around the world and what was missing was right there. Um, and then uh, I realized one of the biggest things missing from the world is our connection to the natural world because we have created artificial boundaries. So this is a park written from, uh, a poem written um, from that space. It's called The Sacrifice. The difference between animals and us, the main one, they don't need to know it's a park. The coyote lopes through just the same, looking for food. We stop in mourning, sensing everything we've lost. We call that ceremony a park. Over to you. Yeah. Well, interesting you bring up, wonderful, you bring up uh, Paris when I was working on the Manatee Humanity Project, which was inspired by um, just the need of, but specifically meeting a manatee, having a manatee encounter at the um, aquarium near the Miami Book Fair. I sort of wanted to get away from all that. And um, it was a wounded female, very scarred manatee affected by um, uh, monofilament line, uh, blades from motorboats, that sort of thing. And I just, we stared in each, each other's eyes a really long time. And if you study something about the manatee, the whole species, there's incredible empathy and playfulness, a little bit like the dolphin story. But when I was in Paris, I visited the Museum of Skeletons, which is extraordinary. It's in that whole area of museums, and it, there are these beautiful white um, skeletons. They look as if they've just bleached in the sun, the, you know, yesterday. Uh, but they're lined up, and they're all sort of in this great, you know, as if they're going into, onto Noah's Ark. Not that it's two by two, but it's connected species. And the, in my research, I learned that the manatee is very closely related to the elephant. And so the elephant and the manatee, their skeletons, were next to one another. And what you see is this great, in all the creatures, all the birds, this great movement from the chest, this kind of uh, you know, aspiration is how I felt it. So I just, just to say the, the way that place and what you're doing and you're, you're, whether you're on some kind of very um, intentional sort of project or poem, but to be open to that sort of that what we call documentary poetics in a way that you're, you know, you're pushing it a little further and you're, you're influenced by where you are and the histories of where you are. So There's great. a poem at the start of her, her book, Manatee Humanity, which is about uh, the manatee called Undercurrent, which is too long for you to read from. But it's a beautiful sort of description of going through a kind of Buddhist ritual and how your, your mind and your consciousness fights it. And then you get to some degree to this manatee. And, and at first, you're looking at it with pity. And you're thinking, God, this poor animal, it's, it's sort of wounded and, and molested by civilization and us. And then at some point, you enter the manatee's head, and the manatee's looking back at you with a sense of pity. Yeah, much more pity for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the ritual was such, it's called the Kala Chakra initiation. I just decided to put the manatee in the center of the mandala. You know, always the, there's always some iconography you know, that you're aspiring to. So the manatee became the, the uh, idol on, the, you know, the, the, the icon, et cetera. I, I, as I was reading this book and her, her new book, Trickster um, Feminism, there, I kept circling around one of this, this issue. Buddhism teaches us that everything is evanescence and that one of our ego problems is trying to hold on to things. The knowability of the world as taught to us by, by the apparatuses of technology is one of the giant fallacies of our world. And yet the poem you just started with, the, the archive poem is, and yet we want to make our imprint. We want to record our consciousness dealing with our even essence. I What's wonder, that about? Yeah, what is that about? <laughs> well, I think we're, you're a teacher as well. So some idea of leaving a trace because you, we have these master narratives that we're completely you know, stuck in and they're all involved with empire and destruction and violence and capital. And I mean, we're going through uh, incredible upheavals just constantly and we're also still living this unresolved karma over the various wars. I've, you know, my lifetime has been a series of wars. That's almost how I, I dated, conflicts and wars. And still, you know, when they talk about ending the Korean War, that was, you know, a primary war in, my, in the 50s. And um, it was called a, what was it, a, what was the euphemism, a conflict. In any case, this sense of 
that those being the narratives, and of course in, ep in the epic tradition you have um, people telling the stories of their tribes, of their uh, aspirations and so on, but it's always in this place, you know, in media race, which means you come in in the middle, you're always in the middle of some kind of conflict and war. And then you have, I was, you know, doing things for a trickster and I invoke Clytemnestra, you know, coming from this totally dysfunctional family. She's born out of an egg because, um, I forgot, her father isn't Zeus, but there are two eggs that come out of Leda, who's a swan, and Zeus has, you know, disguised himself. You all know this story, but just this, and I was watching TV and watching some of the build up to the election and sort of feeling, if I were Clytemnestra, and this were my family, any case, that sort of um, need to work with the old myths, work with the old tales, and try to tell it as poets do, as writers do, as artists do, as thinkers, and, and you know, anybody, interested in reclaiming our cult culture, which is all these things, our music, our thinking, our, you know, we have to be um, creative about how we do that. And, and, you know, there's been so much violence these last years within our culture here. So the task was how to, and then I look back, you know, this was a task about, and still is, you know, from climate change to endangered species, and then gossamer is about saving what might be valuable to somebody in the future. So, I, I mean, my, I think my intention is to leave, I was left little wisps of things. I could hear a recording of Mayakovsky or Antony Artaud, you know, what, a, a minute. You know, there's only 20 minutes of Gertrude Stein in the Library of Congress. <laughs> and, all, and all we have from Sappho are fragments. Fragments, exactly. I, I wonder if you can read a tiny bit from, from Trickster Feminism. It's a beautiful book, but it's also dedicated to um, her friend, the poet uh, Joanne Kiger, uh, the jazz pianist um, and composer Jerry Allen, Jerry Allen and Paulina um, Ol Oliveros. Oliveros. Who is also a, a composer. And it's a, I feel one of the ways to deal, well, one of the ways I deal as a person with, um, fleetingness is, is to look around me and, and sort of try to register what I'm glad I know, people I know usually. And so writing tributes towards or elegies for other people to me is one of the ways to live still within a, a, a as smallly de-egoed self as possible and yet still not live within the fantasy of uh, immortal life. What about your mother's death? Were you able to draw on memory primarily or documents or um, dream I, life? I was living in London um, when she died. I went back and I saw her when she died. And, and then I went, moved back to London and my dad sent me a recording, which I didn't know existed, of her voice. One of the things that really broke my heart is the voice in my head was completely different from her voice. Mm -hmm. She had an upstate New York accent. She said, John, you know, and I, I just thought, who is this person that's been in my head? You know, it's like... It's another person. And so I, I, in writing the book, I was trying to find the person that she was, and I still realized I would never know. And I think that's one of the hard things, to some degree, about being the son of a mother, is that they don't, you will never know them. Did you, were you writing it for yourself, for others, for family, for the world? It's like phantom limb syndrome. You still try, try to use the limb, and instead of using the limb to pick up things or to hug her, I was using it with language, and it turned into poems. Mm. Amazing. Well, you have to read too. No, you you go first. Well, this is this is not elegiac exactly, but it's a challenge to the patriarchus instead of patriarchy. I'm saying patriarchus, and um, I think it came. There was various demonstrations. This book is around protest, about around resistance, a lot going on in New York and abroad. Everywhere I went, I felt I had to speak for my culture in a way, or. And, and also what I was saying about reclaiming um, language for it, how to do that, how to not get to be depressed every morning, having a task, waking up, being on assignment as a poet, creating these ritual strategies. I was, I'm still doing them. I was in New York, you know, circling the gold tower last week, you know, doing little mumbo jumbo <laughs> rituals. It's not come down yet. I'm not, the, the magic isn't working. Anyway, patriarchus. Drone and cope did trap culture ruinously. Triage did chaos reshape history. Girls in the dark trying to read a man's world. Free electron with atom collides then enfolds. Didn't grok tangent. Patria to make kinder spread. Dissing widening then worsening word lore. 
did assassin's teeth, patriarchas, tectonics, tethered pathological oligarchy, did memory bites, surrounds money, did this a grammar digital, patriarchas, language entwined, polis vernacular holds, does this, you do this, you do this. Tightening coil, I curse you, antic of animal on kill, irreparable, marked, did this, enslaved, get lost, does this, spits out derivatives, you do this, out of nothing, anamnensis, out of lethargon and unforgetting, fields of unsheathed wheat, cots, bunks, prisons, insider cuss, you did this, these conditions, apocalyptic scenarios, laws to ensnare our agency, agency, Grind and toil of meat wheel, how dallied this world gone mute. You did this in oscillation, does this a coup, all turns did this, stress this world, crude in light, iron fist, photon disquiet, waves of probability, code to names and word, but I am diamond fortress, am forest of refugees, code to names and words. Rescue men and boys, am escape, falling city, poets with cusps on zodiac, but you did this, your projectiles in the continuum, but I feel love, I feel love and gnosis, and I am your spy agency. Personated as person, am legitimate imposter, topos woman, but never forget, you sold us out, patriarchus, you sold us down the river, you did this in cheap coinage, you, with slaver's tongue, banks closed, goosed out of here, shrank us, you greased us over, lifetimes will remember, you did this, you do this. We'll be pacifying, we'll be enriching, we'll be magnetizing, we'll be destroying, and never wear out a cosmic war on you. My name is Ann Waldman, and I approve this message. <laughs> God, the, how do you follow this? <laughs> I'm just like one of those people following a jet stream, you know, like how all these birds are kind of floating on thermals. Um, uh, let's see, what, what I'll read. Um, I'll, my mother was a social worker for hospice patients, and so one of the, the things that she gave to me was the ability to listen, and sometimes that sneakily creeps its way into poems. And um, I, I don't have the lung capacity or the energy that... Um, or the, the bardic yawp that lives inside you. Um, but I, I, my ear is bigger than my face, and so sometimes poems fall into it. And um, I, to me, the, one of the biggest places that the violence is written in our world is, is on the bodies of others uh, or ourselves. Um, and so I, I was at a um, literary festival like this in Sarajevo, and I, it was getting late, and then suddenly three guys who were almost seven feet tall showed up. Um, and I played basketball in high school, and so I went over to them and said, okay, what the hell are you guys doing here? And it turned out they were all professional players for the former Yugoslav team. Um, and then they told me a story, and it, 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 go, it, it goes like this. It's called The Ex-Basketball Players. The ex-basketball players, they want to tell me what it was like playing youth tournaments during the war how hilariously and inappropriately they were dressed. They double over. This guy was shot, they say, pointing to their point guard, now a conductor, which they find equally comical. He has scars, and for a moment, I think he's going to lift his shirt, the quietest and the drollest of the group. But instead, he talks of an all-night drive back to Sarajevo in 1995 and how, still bandaged and bleeding into his uniform and sweats, he told the bus driver, I can't go back, and got out with three friends in Slovenia, 4 a.m. We took some sleep in the park and phoned a friend of a friend who asked how we were, three teenagers in a park at dawn. I had this much money in my pocket. We said, we're fine, we're okay. But two days later, we weren't. We had just 20 euros left. Our agent stalling, she didn't want us showing up smelly in Italy. So the friend of a friend took us in for a few days. It was nice, showers, hot food, no shelling. But three, three days in, claps hands, that's it, boys. So it's time for our agent to come through. And miraculously, we're on a train across Europe, as if our homes aren't on fire, sitting with travelers, reading the New York Times, as if our sisters aren't being shot. And for months, the agent, she shops us around Europe, taking us to tournaments, to tryouts. 
Maybe our price was too high, the four of us. It was fucking hysterical. No one wants a refugee on their team. We were like four monkeys on a rope. That's when they all double over in laughter and form a circle and hug and someone changes the subject. I guess I was going to ask something or bring up something about ab being able to uh, live on and live in a parallel way while this is going on, especially if it's very close to home, how you, you know, reckon doing that. I mean, some part of me just wants to be out of America a lot of the time, but also be out there doing things that are patriotic in a way. And um, just wonder how you you know, reckon that. I mean, obviously you've traveled and been places. Sometimes I'm in a place where I think I'd rather be, I'd be more effective if I were back there in the center of the storm. But if I write about it, if I can, you know, access it in these other ways through telling stories and talking to people, sometimes that works. Just your take um, on that. Yeah, that's a good question, because uh, I, I, I've traveled a lot for my former job and, uh, and to Sarajevo because I'm on this festival. and. I think the biggest thing to do is to, just to listen. Um, Sarajevo was under siege for, it's the longest modern siege in, warf in warfare. It was under siege for three years and NATO stopped this with a you know, one hour bombing run uh, on Serbian um, tank positions. So you know, 36,000 people didn't really have to die, um, but Bill Clinton was in the middle of an affair <laughs> and he felt like it would be seen as distractionary if he bombed um, the shelling positions. And so I, I, the first instinct I have going places like that is to um, apologize, which is, a, which is maybe appropriate, but also idiotic. And then to see people through suffering, but the suffering is 23 years old, and a lot of people um, have moved on from the war, even if it has scar wounds. And so, so the, I spent a lot of time deeply silent and just listening to people. Um, and some people know visitors want to hear, the, the, in Sarajevo, for example, the, the war stories. And then those pass, and then other stories get told. Right. And layers and layers of stories get told if, as a listener or interlocutor, you, you lead with open questions or silence. And so um, that's my approach yeah. to being places. I remember being so inspired by Susan Sontag, who went to Sarajevo and did uh, productions of Waiting for Godot. And there, you know, there was, the drama was going on. I mean, it was, uh, people were coming out under, with life threats. You know, there'd be shot, fire shot, uh, gunshots during the, in the evening. And uh, she, they, there was no electricity, and so you had, she was, I guess, lit, lighting it by candlelight, which is quite amazing. And I remember it was lit by lighters. And lighters, yeah. Um, yeah. I, it, you know, the, one of the things that I love about your work, that it, it gives me such courage, is that we have an enormous amount of freedom in this country to, to speak our minds. And there, has, there are obvious obstacles for any different yeah. type of poet. Um, but when you travel outside the United States, you realize that some of those obstacles are far more lethal. Right, um, right. And so I, I think there's an obligation as a poet in the United States to think transnationally. Yeah, no, very good point. When I went to, um, right after the Velvet Revolution, went to the Czech Republic and met people, and I was traveling with Allen Ginsberg, and he had been there during, you know, 20 years before being the King of, King of May, Kral Mahalas. As we were landing, he was writing The Return of the King of May. So he had a poem entering. But we visited a lot of people he had known, you know, often uh, people who'd been students and younger. And they had uh, tr little trap doors, you know, under their floor rugs with copies of, uh, you know, Bob Dylan records and uh, copies of Hal and, and Blue Jeans at one point were banned. And I think Beethoven was banned. I mean, it was just uh, a real Iowa opener. He has this line in Wichita, Sutra Vortex, all our language is taxed by war. War, yeah. And I feel like um, yeah. you, you have untaxed that language with your work. Um, You're it, doing it too. Thank you for reading. Are we, the bell. I'm so sorry, I'm so Oh no, don't be sorry. I thought maybe it was just a musical accompaniment. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> 